we then realize that it may not be a good idea and not possible to go to different places and do the program every time so we started with the e learning starting off with the free youtube videos and there are over 400 videos which are available uh, freely in that perspective and these videos basically are accessible to across the globe and lot of people have been accessing these video over this time and uh, as we are uh, looking at currently there are lot of people who are subscribing even to this program as well so there are over uh, 1.5 million views which have been given in these videos in terms of this e learning program we then realized that we needed to have a structured program rather than just having some videos so we started off first with a fellowship program from 2017 and till date in the regency center of diabetes endocrinology and research we have had 11 fellows who have been involved and i remember dr kapoor when we went for the first time and he said that yes we should start the program it was one of the few centers which started the program at that point of time so in the last 7 years continuously we have got very good fellows and with good support from the hospital in 2018 we started the online learning portal medi classes and then lot of books and application came up so we have got pediatric endocrine learning tools we have got fellowship programs in pediatric endocrinology a two year course and many of the people who are here actually are part of that course they are coming four times in a two year period to gain experience clinical as well as learning in that perspective we have developed the medi classes endocrinology app which i was talking about is the most downloaded pediatric endocrinology app with over 5000 installs lot of publications coming onto it we are working in terms of developing connected clinics which will help out people develop personalized care in terms of specific disorders so we have developed tools to guide evaluation for growth failure which have been validated there are tools for management of diabetic ketoacidosis which have been shown to reduce the complications of dka we have developed a bone age application which provides within 2 minutes a reliable and valid way to assess bone age which has already been published a lot of other interpreters are there which are being published include our obesity interpreter our puberty interpreter as well as thyroid interpreter so these interpreters are going to make life very easy you have to enter the values and you will get the right outcome and they have been validated in a large number of patients in that perspective we have also developed a dsd interpreter and the next step which vibha was talking about was the bone age assisted interpretation of growth in which all the pediatricians have to do is to enter some basic information with regards to the child in terms of their age in terms of their birth weight and other parameters and then you have to enter about their pubertal status and then you can either have a manual entry of bone age or you can have a data which you have to select the sites and get the right data in terms of bone age now this bone age assisted interpretation of growth is a tool we have been using and validating for the last one year in our center and this has been found to be perfect in terms of not only plotting the data but also getting a lot of interpretation and whether our puberty and growth is going normal or not so this is going to be probably a way in which we can really screen a large number of normal children as well as patients who are coming to different pediatricians in terms of school as well as clinic to get the right guidance in terms of evaluation and management from that regards so we have got different courses we have on site course so we have had seven on site courses till now and yesterday we had a big number of around 48 participants from across the world actually and over 300 patients who had come from different parts of the country to specifically come and get exposed in this perspective we have got multiple publications and we have now coming up today with the second edition of medi classes basic pediatric endocrinology so uh, we'll be discussing about hyperandrogenism and uh, oligomenorrhea in a case based fashion in this grand round um for hyperandrogenism the key features and pointers are hirsutism that has to be objectively uh, seen taking a proper ferriman galloway score acne severe recalcitrant acne so not the mild acne the acne for which you require treatment and definitely if there are features of anovulation irregular periods so these are the pointers for hyperandrogenism Se- severely severe hyperandrogenism would present with virilization which is voice change muscular habitat and um, hello sorry uh, and uh, uh, basically the f- full male habitus and if it is rapidly progressive it could be sinister and other rare things like hidden adenitis saporovita and alopecia hirsutism very important to differentiate uh, between velous hairs 
hypertrichosis and true hirsutism so if you have excessive hairs but the hairs are uh, very thin hypopigmented and are present in the non sexual areas of the body like the uh, arm and the lower legs uh, these are the areas this is generally just the fine hairs not hirsutism hypertrichosis can occur due to some sort of drugs and some conditions and definitely uh, again not happening in the sexual areas and the sexual areas which we look at the ferriman galloway score and grade them so if the these are the nine sexual areas we all know about it and if the hairs are here we can grade them and objectively identify hirsutism so anything below a score of 8 is not hirsutism mild 8 to 15 and if it is more than 15 it is sort of diagnostic of hyperandrogenism anything very severe hirsutism rapidly progressive in uh, hirsutism that needs a very urgent sort of an um, assessment so if the ferriman galloway score is uh, less than 8 it's unlikely between 8 to 15 uh, again you need to confirm it by doing a total testosterone no need to do a free testosterone uh, and then if it is more than 55 nanograms per deciliter then we are looking at hyperandrogenism if a very um, uh, you know uh, above uh, then we are looking at hyperandrogenism here and if it is very severe say more than 15 Gar galloway score uh, again in our resource poor setting it's not needed to actually quantify it it's obviously going to be hyperandrogenism but you can confirm it uh, so uh, for coming on to the most common cause of hyper uh, androgenism uh, in young women is polycystic ovarian syndrome there are other causes as well so it's a syndrome of both hyperandrogenism and anovulation unexplained hyperandrogenism hyperandrogenism which is persistent for 2 years so that is very important when we are looking in this age group so between 12 to 18 years it's very important to look at and if it is in ovarian ovarian origin then we say it's hyperandrogenism um basically what are the uh, parameters so these are the parameters that will be basically looking at so features of hyperandrogenism if it's absent Uh, no workup is needed but if there are features of virilization definitely an adrenal and ovarian imaging needs to be done uh if no features of virilization then we go in for our hormonal workup which is looking at other causes of anovulation like the thyroid profile prolactin and dhes uh, dhes if it is more than 700 we are looking at adrenal origin of the androgens and then that needs to be ruled out but if it is low then work up for even 17 ohp is sometimes needed in some particular cases and we'll be discussing about it and if all those things turn out to be normal then we've got the diagnosis of exclusion which is the polycystic ovarian syndrome again we'll be going to our cases pcos again um uh, for younger patients in the adolescent age group we do not want to label these girls as pcos because the diagnosis once is very difficult and we have got this uh, cases of hyperandrogenism of puberty so we label them at risk of pcos and very commonly these patients with lifestyle management and proper treatment we can actually we are able to reverse their disease progression as well that's why we treat them but we don't label them the other thing is a definite a hyperandrogenic anovulation for more than 2 years this is the case where we would want to basically definite very aggressively treat them because then hyper state per se can induce pcos like uh, gonadotropin setup in them so uh, we all the negative feedback mechanism of the pituitary is uh, uh, very much modified by testosterone and a very high testosterone level in in utero and during puberty can set up this uh, gonadostat to male levels and then they they become very high lh level patients and that's why then they turn out to be true pcos um severe hirsutism and if there is uh, an ovulatory bleeding available then also we need to actually treat them and if there is associated obesity metabolic syndrome and those things um Uh, good afternoon everyone so after this excellent and crisp uh, explanation about uh, hyperandrogenism we'll start with some cases so our first case is a 14 year old girl presented with hirsutism 
menarche was just one year back uh, at the age of 13 years and she is having periods in every two months fgs score was done it was around 6 and usg is showing a pco appearance someone has labeled this child as uh, pco so dr vijay sir i would like to know whether this diagnosis you are agreeing with this no absolutely not we have to uh, don't have to jump upon the diagnosis on the basis of ultrasound pco appearance first so as uh, ma'am has already discussed that hyperandrogenism and anovulation and this unexplained hyperandrogenism to be persist for beyond 2 years and it has to be proven that ovarian origin then only we are going to label the pco so for this case the fgs score is very low that is less than 8 so that and uh, the symptoms are less than 1 year so i don't think that we do have to label even pcos uh as sir has extremely uh, uh, said there is no role of pco morphology in adolescence yes. and less than 8 fgs score is not a marker of hyperandrogenism in this case so coming on to the next case uh, second case a 14 year old girl presented with hirsutism again the menarche was one year before and period she is having every two months now there is some features of virilization in terms of muscularity and fgs score is 18 this time and someone has again labeled this child as pco so dr pradeep sir i would like to know whether uh, this diagnosis is correct or not uh, here what we see uh, the fgs score is significant it is 18 and uh, apart from that virilization and masculinity is also there so definitely we will be you know worried and uh, work up further so what we see here uh, the testo is high very high yes. uh, it's more than 150 to 30 nanogram per deciliter so we will further work up for whether it is from ovarian origin or adrenal gland origin and so so we go for imaging and as well as we see how much the dhes level is so it's too high it's 900 nanogram uh, let's see what is the imaging so we we'll definitely like to see the imaging so the imaging is showing okay it's a big mass so definitely we will be worried and we'll take the surgical consultation so the key thing here in both the cases is that the clinical parameters is very important ultrasound label any hyperandrogenism as polycystic ovarian pattern so that is not going to be the diagnostic and if it is a rapidly progressive um, uh, virilizing uh, hyperandrogenism it is always sinister and has to be worked up properly so the next case a 15 year old girl uh, concerned about her hair she has a normal menstrual cycle uh, there are some hair growth around the body but gs score was around 3 uh, there are some family history is present like to how would you like to uh, proceed further in this case so the main concern here is of that of hair growth yes. so first uh, on clinical assessment we need to see the uh, perimen galvisco which is fairly normal in this case and uh, we need to also look into what uh, is the nature of hair is it uh, villous type of hair uh, is there any family history of similar hair pattern in the um, in the family and uh, if it's only fg of 3 uh, the key message here would be not to over uh, uh, work up in the like uh, counsel the child counsel the parents and do not uh, over investigate sometimes some of these patients already come with an ultrasound done by a local doctor and they are already labeled as polycystic ovarian syndrome very important for them to be counseled properly that this is normal hair growth and and that way to lay, take the label away from pco also some drug intake is is very important in that perspective whether the patient has taken any drug like prednisolone cyclosporine or that so this is a villus hair and a diagnosis was hypotrichosis so we will follow up the child in further Uh, now the next case, uh, case number four is a 16 year old girl presented with hirsutism, amenorrhea for the last three months. There was no obesity, no galactorrhea present in this child. Testosterone level done was 68, a bit high for this uh, girl. And someone that uh, did a 17 OHP level, which seems to be pretty high, 600. So Dr. Vibha, I would like to know whether you will label this case as uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia or not. Uh, definitely not because uh, uh, she has a clinical and the uh, as well as biochemical 
uh, parameters of hyperandrogenism. And if we see the testosterone is more than 55, to definitely we look for the 17 OHP. But here the 17 OHP is uh, like 600, which comes in the range which suggests us to go for the ACTH stimulation test. But here the girl is amenoric and we are not aware that at what time she will ovulate. So uh, the 17 OHP ideally should be done at the second to 10th day of the periods at the 8 a.m. But there is a high possibility that uh, during the ovulation, it will give the falsely positive, falsely high value. So along with the 17 OHP, we should always do the progesterone level. And if it is less than 175, then truly the value is higher. But if the progesterone level is more than 175, it means the 17 OHP level has been done during the ovulation. So we should be very aware of at what time we are doing it. Yeah. So moving on to the next case, uh, case number four, a 16 year old girl uh, presented with hirsutism, amenorrhea for the three months. There was no, achha, okay, this this is a similar case. And uh, now that normal ST is done, as you explained that this is normal and uh, progesterone level done, which was high, probably the I mean, an evolution would be the reason. That is the reason because of this high 17 OHP level. So the next case of 15 year old. So 17 OHP should be done in the proliferative phase of the cycle. And if the patient is amenoric, then do it with progesterone level to interpret it properly. So for the next case, a uh, 15-year-old girl presented with hirsutism. Menarche was at the age of 13.5 years and having periods every three months. He, uh, she has a FGS score of uh, 16 with severe acne. Testosterone level was 64 and USG is showing a PCOS appearance. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Bijay, sir, I would like to know your opinion regarding this case. Yes, thank you. If you are going to the problems what uh, this young girl is having, that is, uh, though has she attained menarche, that is 13.5 years. And at present, she is of 15 years. So, we are going to only see the duration of the problem is less than two years. But we have to see the severity of the problem. That is, menarche and every, this menses is every three months. But you can see the FGS score, that is 16, that is beyond 15. So, it means that she is having fair enough of hyperandrogenism. Testosterone 64 milligram per DL, it means that it is beyond 55 milligram per deciliter. And since there are so many symptoms, so USG is going to add up the diagnosis in this case, that's a PCOS appearance. Since we are not going to label this child as a PCOD, but in view of the severity of disease, we are very sure if it is not being treated at this point of time, probably in coming days, she is going to land up in PCOS. So this is very important that this is a condition where the problem is less than two years of commencement of menarche. But since the severity is very high and the chances to land up in the PCOS is more, so we have to treat this uh, child. So this is an at-risk uh, at PCOS and we have to consider rosepil for this child. So, so it's so, very important in these patients, especially who have a total testosterone level above 55 nanograms per deciliter. And as sir said, with severe symptoms, oligomenorrhea, severe hirsutism, if we don't treat this child and keep her only on lifestyle ma management, we are not going to prevent PCOS. There is a, you know, a proper chance that this patient, if she loses weight, gets her lifestyle corrected and we correct her androgens, which is very important, we'll be able to prevent development of PCOS. Okay, for the next case, 17-year-old girl presented with hirsutism. Menarche was at the age of 14 years, presented with oligomenorrhea. FGS score is with high 18. She had acne and BMI of 32. That uh, categorizes uh, her into an obesity category. Testosterone level was 72 nanogram per DL. And USG is showing again a PCOS appearance. Dr. Pradeep sir, I would like to know your treatment management plan from this case. So uh, this symptomatic child rather adolescent so what we see here the gap is more than two years so and fgs score is significant test is also significant so definitely it is definite pcod and uh, simultaneously the child is obese also so we will definitely we should treat this child uh, and what we do here uh, we should treat the children with uh, lifestyle modification we should add metformin as well as ocps also we should give 
yeah this is a so this is a case of pcos and we have to sir as explained uh, that we have to treat with lifestyle modification metformin and ocpls in this child ma'am so after uh, follow up of this child 3 months later she had uh, regular periods uh, but uh, lo she uh, loses her weight for 3 kg but her sutism is same again and the patients uh, parents are concerned about this thing so okay. sir what would be your advice regarding this case yes yes so what we see there is a bit of improvement weight the child losing the weight but what we see there is lag period when so when you start treatment there is lag period of almost 6 to 12 months so what we we should counsel the parents if they are more concerned the cosmetic measures we can offer definitely the life uh, you know the life cycle of hairs is 6 monthly yes. so even before 6 months we won't be able to actually correct the hirsutism so they need a proper counseling to adhere to the treatment so again on follow up for after 6 months later so now 9 months from the diagnosis there is no improvement in hirsutism the child has gained weight this time and she is using the cosmetic measures So, sir, I would like to know you would add any medication or something in this case. Okay. Sir. So again, the concern is there. The the she is using cosmetic measures also. Weight gain is now here. Ah, uh, so here we can consider adding some anti-androgens in the form of you know spironolactone. We can add, and we we'll should see the improvement. So, out of hundred, only about say twenty to thirty percent patients we require to add anti-androgen with that androgen levels. So, we'll be able to prevent it in seventy percent by strictly adhering to the treatment. So, again, after follow up nine months later, now one point five years from the diagnosis, the patient is stable, having some intramenstrual bleeding, and patients are again concerned and worried. Sir, what would be your opinion regarding this to the parents? so uh, i think this intra intermenstrual bleeding uh, can happen sometime uh what we can do here uh, maybe we can uh, the the adherence issue is there so we can consider you know improving the dose so it's basically any long term treatment the problem of compliance is always there so proper counseling Well, understanding that if you skip the dose, you will have intermenstrual bleeding. Those things are very important, yes. and that also leads to a poor response that we are showing, uh, seeing in these patients. So now the follow up is for more than two point five years, one one year later, and now there is improvement in her sutism. Weight has decreased, and periods are regular. Okay, so here the the uh, the girl the girl is improving. but what we have to do we have to we do, don't have to start the uh, stop the treatment we have at least we should give post menarcal 5 years so the, the, the treatment has to be uh, you know continued so as sir has explained we have to wait for at least 5 years from the menarche yes. till the gynecological maturity till we stop yes. our treatment for consideration yeah that's a very very common concern of the parents that when we will be stopping and even after stopping there is a very high chance that the yeah. irregularity of period returns yes. if the patient has not reached the goals of their weight and their lifestyle so moving on to the next case a 16 year old girl presented with hirsutism Onset was one year ago, and she has also complaints about oligomenorrhea. Now this time she has severe menorrhagia and presented to us. Testosterone level was ninety nanogram per dl, and USG is showing a PCOS appearance. Doctor Sugandha, ma'am, I would like to know your approach in terms of acute and the chronic management in this child. Uh, so as we can see that she had oligomenorrhea menorrhea to begin with, and her androgen levels testo was more than fifty five. uh and usg is also suggestive of a pcod appearance so uh, this fits well with the picture of pcod but the current issue is that of menorrhagia so uh, here we need to uh, first address the menorrhagia part and then later on uh, uh, treat the pco part so menorrhagia will be treated with high dose estrogen estro uh, initially and then later on maybe we have to give a combination with e plus p 
So, ma'am, any key messages from this case? Basically, this patient has an ovulation and an ovulatory bleeding. So, when if we are using an estrogen progesterone combination, we have to use at least minimum of thirty micrograms of estrogen. That's why high high dose estrogen has to be given in cyclical pa pattern. Or if there is a continuous bleeding, a patient has been bleeding for 10, 20 days and bleeding did not stop, we have to use high-dose progesterone to stop the bleeding and then transfer the patient into uh, estrogen-progesterone combination. Very important for these patients who have high testosterone level not to give them only progesterone. Otherwise, we are not correcting. We are just symptomatically managing this patient. So looking at the overall picture, even though the concern was menorrhagia, we have to correct the testosterone. Otherwise, whenever we will stop, she will go back into the same vicious cycle of endometrial hyperplasia and heavy bleeding. Yeah. So the next case, a 16-year-old girl child present with severe hirsutism. FGS score is 28. Parents are concerned as well as the child. Uh, she had complaints about oligomenorrhea. And testosterone level done was high, 1 110 uh, nanogram per DL. So the USG is showing a PCOS appearance. Dr. Viva, I would like to know your approach in this case. So the patient is, uh, the FG score of the patient is quite high. This is severe hyperandrogenism along with the oligomenorrhea. And biochemically, she has 110 testosterone, which is quite high. So for the management of this case, definitely we should start the E plus P combination because the estrogen here will increase the uh, this SHBG level, which will decrease the free testosterone and which will help in decreasing the hirsutism. So definitely E plus P, uh, the therapy will help the patient. So here we are all, we are presenting these cases in a short manner because um, all the other things have been ruled out. So, there, uh, you know, we've ruled out all the adrenal causes and other things. And this is an isolated ovarian hyperandrogenism. In these cases, we want, if we want to decrease the testosterone levels because they are really high, we have to give them a continuous estrogen progesterone with, a, you know, a three monthly regimen. And then only we'll be able to sort it out with this or add anti-androgen because it's quite high. Yes, so the next case, a 17-year-old girl child presented with hirsutism and it presented immediately after menarche. Now it is rapidly progressing for last six months. She had also amenorrhea, muscularity and voice change in terms of virilization and testosterone level was 200 nanogram per DL in this child. Dr. Vijay sir, I would like to know your plan of management in this case. Yes, so uh, what I can see that um, Progression is very rapid. That is rapidly progressive for last six months. Amenorrhea to muscularity and even vice. It means that uh, there is a hyperandrogenism and we can see that testosterone level is very high. So I can think that there can be quite severe disease and this child to be evaluated for maybe uh, say ADCC or something like that. So imaging is really very must. So this is the USG picture of that girl okay. in a large ovary. Yes. Probably the hypothesis would be the reason that could cause this kind of picture in this child. So after ruling out adrenal and other causes, if there is isolated ovarian hyperandrogenism of main levels, then with such large ovaries, then diagnosis of hyperthecosis is made and typically these patients have a normal onset of puberty and a secondary sort of uh, appearance very much like something going wrong with the ovaries here so now the child is on estrogen progesterone preparation and spironolactone but uh, she had the persistent symptoms virilization is still progressive testosterone level is now 240 nanogram per dl uh, sir, what would be your plan? What would yes, I think we have to continue the medical management, but the agony of the parents and what we can see here, that spironolactone and other anti-androgen to be added. Despite of that, if the patient's symptoms are not improving, probably there can be some other uh, manual that is um, uh, I, uh, that is uh, dot therapy. That is, we are going to uh, make the, some holes on the ovary to reduce the volume of that even wedge resection has been provided. So that thing we have to think. Otherwise, on the medical management, if they are not responding to these usual therapy, GNRH analog therapy on a, uh, a three monthly basis can be tried. Or initially monthly basis, we have to see the response and then we have to get shift on the 
So they've got a very high volume of theca yes. cells, which are still under the control of the gonadotropins. So if we shut down the gonadotropins, we'll be able to, you know, uh, treat this condition. And then the ovarian size also decreases. And when you stop it further, it doesn't go back to the previous pattern. And also one more important thing to add, uh, estrogen in this child, so it doesn't have any deficiency and uh, considering her bone age uh, in this uh, uh, status. So... Um, over to you, ma'am. So again, uh, for the next round, we've got oligomenorrhea. Again, the diagnosis of oligomenorrhea is basically the symptom of, you know, uh, has to take into account what is her postmenarchal age. So in the first year, if somebody is having less than four periods, in the second to fourth year, if it is less than six periods, and in the fifth year, less than eight periods, we say it is a oligomenorrhea. And after five years, it's the adult diagnosis. Uh, so uh, we say amenorrhea, if it is no periods by 15 years of age or more than three years of tilaki. Secondary, if it is more than three months after the onset of periods, we say it is basically secondary amenorrhea. So oligomenorrhea, very important in this age group. We have to exclude pregnancy, other causes of anovulation like hypothyroidism, hyperprolactinemia, which is also very common. Now, the key in precocious puberty, we were talking about LH as being the key hormone. The key hormone here is the FSH. And if FSH is high, we are looking at gonads that are not working. It is ovarian insufficiency. And the workup here needs to be rule out any sort of uh, Turner syndrome or other causes of premature ovarian insufficiency and also an autoimmune workup. Uh, if the FSH level is normal or low, then we have to assess uh, clinically or by doing this estrogen status. Uh, so look at the breast, endometrium, and vaginal mucosa. Hypoestrogenic, we need to do some screening tests, uh, like uh, you know any other causes of functional hypothalamic uh, amenorrhea, uh, like chronic disorders. And especially celiac disease presents in this manner. If there is anemia and um, uh, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism here that is happening as secondary amenorrhea, if it is normal, so these are the cases where you have to look at the hypothalamic pituitary axis and you need to do the MRI to rule out any acquired causes of dysfunction here, maybe tumor infection or pituitary hypophysitis, lymphocytic hypophysitis, those things present in this manner. And if all these things are normal, if there are any additional hyperandrogenic uh, features, even PCOS presents as primary amenorrhea, so we need to look for an ovulation happening due to hyperandrogenism as one of the cause of oligomenorrhea here. Uh, if the FGS is above 8 and if the testosterone is high, maybe that is the cause of oligomenorrhea. Um, if there is, then work up. Now, if there is no response to, so you can have secondary amenorrhea due to some uterine cause as well. So if you are having endometritis or uh, intrauterine adhesions due to tuberculosis, we see all those things happening. So they will not have any response to estrogen and progesterone withdrawal. So that would be a cause of secondary amenorrhea. So I'll start with some cases. Uh, case number 10, 15 year old girl uh, concerned about her scanty periods. Menarche at the age of 13 years and uh, she had she is having periods every six weeks of uh, duration of one day. So she was advised estrogen and progesterone preparation. Dr. Pradeep sir, I would like to know whether this thing is right or you would like to modify anything in this case. Okay, so uh, as ma'am has reviewed uh, the initial slides that we have to first define uh, the oligomenorrhea. What we see here, she is having after 13 years, she, uh, she is right now 15 years after menarche, almost two years has happened. And she has a period of six weeks, uh, every six yes. weeks, which will come annually around nine. Okay. Hmm. So anything, she is more than two years, two to four years. So if it is less than six, then only we can label it as oligomenorrhea. Here it is approximately nine or more. So the workup is not needed, so unnecessarily she was advised OCPs. Yeah, we will keep her in follow-up to see yes. the progression yes. or improvement and reassurance. That is what is needed in this patient. Scanty periods make these patients really very much worried. worried yes. And that is why maybe sometimes for scanty periods we do a, a few tests. But definitely most of the patients we don't need to provide them treatment. Okay. So... 
the next case a 17 year old girl uh, she had menarche 4 years ago that means at the age of 13 years she has uh, she is having now infrequent periods and there is no periods for the last 3 months she had uh, lost some weight and having some lethargy uh, baseline investigation in terms of lh fsh and estradiol has been done showing a low levels and diagnosed as hypothalamic amenorrhea but now the child has presented to us with complaints of seizure so dr sugandha ma'am i would like to know where was the pothole in this case uh, so to begin with uh, this she had oligo uh, oligomenorrhea yes. and uh, since her uh, basic profile showed low gonadotropin levels and a low estrogen uh, hypoestrogenic state uh, first we need to do before labeling her as hypothalamic uh, amenorrhea we need to look at the um, some baseline testing and also uh, mri of the head will be essential uh, to look at the pituitary and uh, do we do we have so yes uh, we have the mri of the child okay so here there is a definite mass and uh, uh, there is history of seizures also yes. so uh, so basically before labeling the child as uh, functional amenorrhea we should uh, since it's a diagnosis of exclusion we should always look at the uh, pituitary to rule out any serious uh, so hypogonadotropic hypogonadism always get an imaging done to actually label before labeling as functional hypothalamic amenorrhea so the next case a 17 year old girl presented with secondary amenorrhea menarche has at the age of 12 years and she is having periods every two monthly lhfs is at the normal level 4.4 and 4.9 respectively breast is normal and fgs score is 4 so Viva, I would like to know how do you approach this case? So at the age of 17 years, and that is more than five years of the Minaki, and she is having six periods per year. So definitely she is having oligomenorrhea along with the normal FSS. So as we go with the algorithm, uh, we have to see what is the estrogen status. And uh, for the estrogen status, we have to examine the breasts first, whether they are soft or the firm, that will tell us whether there is low estrogen or not. Another thing we can look at the vaginal mucosa or we can go for the USG endometrium. If the endometrium thickness is more than 6 mm, then definitely it shows there is a good estrogen exposure. And uh, as her FG score is 4, so definitely she is not having any hyperandrogenic features. So uh, for that, uh, we can go for the this uh, progesterone withdrawal in this case and see what happened. Definitely after the progesterone withdrawal, she has she will have the withdrawal bleeding. And so definitely this is a case of annulatory cycle and uh, uh, yes, this is how it's managed. Yes. So, so we have... Uh, as adult gynecologists, we label all these patients as a fourth type of PCOS because they have an ovulation but no hyperandrogenism. But many of these girls have actually type 1 and ovulation, which is there is some dysfunction in the hypothalamic pituitary axis. It could be functional, it could be eating disorders, it could be a lot of other things that can lead to that kind of uh, an ovulation. And at 17 years, we will definitely want to uh, correct her periods. Uh, to avoid development of endometrial hyperplasia and problems related with ovulation. Okay, so for the next case, a 16-year-old girl uh, presented, uh, his, her menarche was at the age of 11 years and having a periods one monthly. Uh, she has FSH, uh, now she had having a secondary amenorrhea. Uh, FSH LH level is quite normal, base is normal stage and FGS score was 1. But there was no response to progesterone in comparison to the previous case. So, Dr. Vijay, sir, I would like to know how do you approach this case? Yes, if I can see here that uh, the age-appropriate binarchy has been achieved and the periods were initially regular. The uh, hormones, that is FSH, LS, they all are normal and even all the things are normal. There is no hypothetical state, at least clinically. So, no response to progesterone. So, I have to see... There, there, there can be other history of systemic disorder or something like that. So I want to have infection or some other thing. So uh, again, so we have to see that if any patient is coming to me like oligomenorrhea, so first uh, we have to exclude the pregnancy, hypothyroidism, hyperprolactemia. We have measured FSS label. And if this is terminally high, it is probably primary ovarian flower or ovarian insufficiency where we are going to rule out the Turner and autoimmune workup. 
on the other hand if fs is is normal or low like uh, in this case so that was normal uh, we have done the estrogen status and this estrogen status was also normal uh, then we have to see whether your patient is responsive to your estrogen progesterone response so again she is not responsive uh, so then we have to see that what is the structural uh, cause so uh, so in nutshell so what i am going to see here that the local thing has been done a hysteroscopy so i would like to see that what is so again we can see now that this is a local cause that is genital tuberculosis that is infection with mycobacteria so again this is science prevail that we have to go to the detail of the things that how what is the expected response once you are uh, giving your drug and if that is not there that is there is no clinical correlation with investigation and your drug response then we have to look out the other causes yes. so that is the so case. this is one case of non endocrine cause of secondary amenorrhea so this patient should be referred for a gynecological evaluation so all her clinical hormonal and functional workups are all normal and when we did a estrogen progesterone withdrawal there was no bleeding so it was a local cause so the next case a 15 year old girl presented with primary amenorrhea breast stage 1 pelvic gas stage 1 and uh, he has height of 152 cm weight of 52 kg fsh level and lh level was quite high for this child and estrogen was undetectable she had some mild hirsutism large cysts present in the in her ovary and has a karyotype of 46xx so dr pradeep sir i would like to know any significant history you want to ask especially to the patients or her parents okay so definitely what we see here she is still prepubertal and uh, so she has quite good height uh, 152 uh, cm and okay weight is okay fsh is lh is uh, lh is very uh, it's it's high and what is important is estradiol is very very low so what we see the the picture is like hyper hypo and she is having uh, mild hyperandrogenism also the karyotype is phenotypically uh, she is female like genetically and she is having large cyst also so as in review ma'am said the initial phase of the you know follicular development uh, the in later stage the lh and estradiol is more important initially fsh is important so that could have you know increased the size of uh, cyst so here what we have to do we have to extensively take the history we can plan genetic workup we can think about steroidogenic defect also and what we see here clearly the she is having maternal virilization and the child had height a good height also yes so if maternal virilization is there so she might have during her gestational period there could have been some endogenic effect or maybe some some androgen would not not have converted into estradiol So I'll definitely think about think about uh, you know aromatase sort of deficiency aromatase deficiency. So key feature here was the ovary like, ovary is responding and yes. still estrogen is not being produced. Not being produced. So you've got large cysts. So FSH is being produced, but the functional hormone is not being produced. So if you've got a patient with uh, this kind of picture, that is sometimes uh, sort of a resistant ovary Stage. syndrome, which can happen in. uh say aromatase deficiency yes. normally all patients with hypergonadotropic hypogonadism have very small ovaries very small streak ovaries here if you've got ovaries with cyst or a polycystic pattern of ovary in a setting of a high fsh you should look for functional defects uh, in the uh, you know the uh, uh, estrogen which is aromatase deficiency one of the common uh, things so the Yes. Okay. So the next case, a seventeen-year-old girl child presented with primary amenorrhea. Now the breast stage is four, PVG stage is four. Height is a bit taller, one sixty-eight centimeter, and weight of fifty-two kg. Here again, the FSH and LH level was high, and estrogen estrogen level was undetectable. Doctor Suganda, ma'am, I would like to know your approach in this case. So what we can see from the clinical picture is that she, uh, this girl. Uh, she has primary 
primary amenorrhea and uh, as dr alapan has mentioned she appears to be tall so here uh, uh, on the workup when we see the fsh levels it's pretty high so any tall girl with primary amenorrhea uh, uh, with high fsh we should always uh, look at the karyotype and keep a possibility of uh, xy dsd and uh, in, so yes we have the karyotype and the karyotype is 46 xy in this child so uh, the key message here would be uh, any tall girl with primary amenorrhea uh, do fsh and if the fsh is high then consider doing a karyotype karyotype so, so this is a, a case of sry defect where uh, male individual and gonadectomy has been advised further in this case so the next case 16 year old girl presented with primary amenorrhea breast stage 1 pvk stage 1 height of 168 cm weight of 52 kg again the lh fsh was high estrogen was undetectable oh yes sorry i think you go back to the previous, previous case one. case 15 the last slide so in this particular patient she attained her puberty uh, on her own even when her karyotype was 46 uh, you know xy karyotype so there was some ovarian function and yet uh, she, her uh, karyotype was this thing so she had a uh, uh, sry defect and next next slide please so any tall girl with premature ovarian insufficiency look for xy dst because yeah and yeah. they can sometimes go enter into puberty as well so if they do not present with completely delayed puberty because some ovarian function is attained during embryogenesis in these patients next slide so next case a 16 year old girl presented with primary amenorrhea breast stage 1 and pvk stage 1 height is on the taller side 168 cm weight of 52 kg fsh lh was again high with undetectable estrogen level karyotype was uh, 46 xy Uh, so this case is very much similar to the previous case, but here we can see there is no pubertal development in the girl. She has B one, P one, and primary amenorrhea. So as uh, the karyotype is X Y, so definitely she uh, this uh, she X Y D X Y D S D. Um, but there she has a uh, this female phenotype. So we have to look for the stereotypic defect. La at this age the stereotype that can present uh, could be 17 beta hsd and if the blood pressure is higher than it could be the 17 hydroxyl h deficiency and, and definitely more the... common yeah so it is xy dsd the entire ovarian function will be gone so that's why she had uh, this thing uh, delayed puberty so we have to look at all the other causes and one of the in this because she had inguinal gonads you were able to pin one Okay, that's all for this. Thank you. So I think the key messages in these patients of oligomenorrhea presenting is to look for their puberty and look for where, what is the age of menarche, and then we can have from mild to very severe cases just by clinical diagnosis we can pinpoint the diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.